Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Jennifer Sabina. Why did a loving husband mutilate his wife? Many of us have heard repeatedly of the severe psychological condition known as post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, but few have thought about what lies behind those three words. The term is used to describe mental disorders that result from a single or repeated encounter with a severe traumatic event. Violence, accidents, disasters, war, etc. This type of disorder is often found in military personnel, people who have been involved in combat and witnessed the deaths of others over a long period of time. Even after returning home, they have a hard time adjusting to civilian life. According to a report by the World Health Organization, one-third of soldiers returning from conflict zones experience some degree of PTSD. Most tragically, their loved ones suffer as well, desperately trying to help them overcome the crisis and get their lives back on track. The family of Benjamin Sabana, an Iraq war veteran, struggled with this problem for years. Unfortunately, the disease proved to be insurmountable. Jennifer Sabin's case shocked the quiet town of Wauwatosa, Wisconsin with its brutality. Moreover, it was the first case of a police officer killed in the line of duty in the town's history. Behind it, all was a tragic story that spanned nearly a decade and culminated in the death of a young woman. Let's start at the beginning to make sense of the situation and try to determine if there was a chance to avoid such a dramatic denouement. Jennifer and Benjamin Sabina, before they met. Jennifer Louise Sabina, nay Miller, was born in 1982 in Milwaukee County, Wisconsin. She was the oldest of two children in her family and grew up with her younger brother, Jacob, with whom she always kept in close touch. When Jennifer went to school, her parents decided to separate and filed for divorce, after which her father moved to another state and stopped playing any role in his children's lives. Her mother had to work hard to provide for the children, but Jennifer was always her main helper and support. She kept the house in order, cooked meals, and took care of her younger brother while their mother worked tirelessly. In addition, Jennifer excelled in school and dreamed of a future career in law enforcement. Benjamin J. Sabina, also a Milwaukee native, was Jennifer's age and even attended the same school as her. However, despite this coincidence, they did not know each other personally. After high school, Benjamin joined the U.S. Marine Corps and served two tours of duty in Iraq. He was honorably discharged in 2005 after suffering a severe concussion and numerous injuries to his body and limbs. The story of how the couple met. While serving in Iraq, Benjamin registered on the newly emerging and rapidly growing social networking site, Facebook. There he searched for his hometown, and while browsing the profiles of fellow citizens, came across the profile of a charming, smiling girl named Jennifer. After researching her information, he realized that they had once attended the same high school, but he couldn't remember her. After thinking for a bit, Sabina decided to approach the pretty girl. He greeted her, told her that he was currently serving in Iraq in the Marine Corps, and asked how she was doing. Jennifer didn't respond right away and briefly wrote that she was doing well. It was obvious that she was not eager to correspond with a stranger, but the young man was not confused. Benjamin began to write to her daily, even if she did not respond. Gradually, he managed to capture the attention of the beauty, and they began to chat casually on various topics, remembering the school where they once studied together, and trying to understand how they had not met before. A mutual liking developed between them, and they even started planning a reunion when Benjamin could come home. By then, Jennifer had graduated from the police academy, received specialized training, and after successfully passing all of her exams, became a police officer in her hometown of Wauwatosa, Milwaukee County, Wisconsin. It was her dream job since her high school years, and she was incredibly proud of it. Jennifer emotionally shared her joy with a pen pal who sincerely congratulated her on this accomplishment, severe injury, and return home. Benjamin was supposed to return home in November 2005, but in February of that year, he and several of his comrades were hit by mortar fire. Almost all of Benjamin's comrades were killed that day, and he miraculously survived but was severely wounded. His kneecap was nearly shattered, his left arm was nearly torn off by shrapnel and held together by only a few tendons and a piece of skin, 
and he suffered shrapnel wounds to his chest, head, and a severe concussion. The Marine was taken to a military hospital where he was painstakingly picked up piece by piece, and when his condition stabilized, transferred to Germany for treatment and rehabilitation. His arm was saved, although it had partially lost sensation and function, but his knee was in much worse condition. Doctors were inclined to believe that Benjamin was unlikely to be able to get back on his feet again. During this time, Jennifer, with whom he corresponded daily, was very supportive and encouraging. She said that she was constantly praying for his recovery, believing in a miracle and hoping for the best. The miracle did happen, and gradually, Sabina began to recover, relearning to walk. A few months later, the demobilized Marine was sent to California, where his military unit was based. After completing the necessary paperwork, he returned to his hometown of Wauwatosa as a combat veteran and disabled veteran, where his parents and Jennifer, with whom he had become very close through correspondence, were waiting for him. By then, Benjamin was continuing his rehabilitation program, which was yielding good results. The muscles of his damaged limbs recovered and became stronger. He started to exercise and soon was able to use his left arm normally and contrary to the doctor's predictions, began to walk and even run. As soon as they met Jennifer for the first time, they realized that they didn't want to part for a day. The couple spent all their time together, talked about everything in the world, and it seemed that they had known each other all their lives. Between the young people began and rapidly developed a passionate romance. Jennifer considered her lover a hero, surrounded him with care and supported him in everything. Benjamin was very grateful to her for this, and at the end of 2005, he offered to make her his lawful wife, to which she happily agreed. They did not delay in registering their marriage and got married on New Year's Eve 2006. Severe post-traumatic stress disorder. The time spent by the young man in war zones did not pass without a trace, leaving him not only scars, but also a deep psychological trauma. Benjamin suffered from complex post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, with all the typical symptoms, including nightmares, increased anxiety, psychotic experiences, known as flashbacks, depression, and thoughts of self-harm. For the former Marine, any loud noise, popping, fireworks, or even the sound of a passing airplane could trigger memories of his horrific experiences. He regularly underwent therapy, worked with specialists, and there were times when the disorder receded so much that his loved ones thought that he returned to normal life but this impression was deceptive. According to Benjamin's own recollections, during the war years, he witnessed the deaths of at least 50 of his comrades, many of whom were close to him, and their loss was felt as a personal grief. Jennifer and Ben attended church together, where the man also sought help in overcoming the psychological problems he faced. A combination of different therapeutic approaches, medical and spiritual, proved effective. Recovery seemed close at hand, but some symptoms appeared to have become chronic. Because Jennifer and Benjamin were still young and full of hope and plans, they decided to postpone having children until his condition stabilized. The couple believed that they had their whole lives ahead of them and that they still had time for everything. However, seven years after the wedding, Benjamin's condition had not improved. He was still plagued by nightmares, panic attacks, and thoughts of self-harm. Moreover, due to his injuries and disorders, the former Marine was not only forced to give up his military career, but was also unable to get another prestigious and promising job. Warning Signs In 2012, seven years into rehab, all the progress Benjamin had made over the years began to rapidly deteriorate. In October, Jennifer confided to her best friend Linda that her husband had acquired a gun that he hardly ever parted with and even slept with it under his pillow. At night, he would often wake up with nightmares, screaming, grabbing the gun, unable to realize where he was, and feeling as if he were still at war surrounded by enemies. At times like these, his wife would try to do her best to calm him down and bring him back to reality. These nightmare episodes became regular, and the sedatives prescribed by the doctor hardly helped. Moreover, Benjamin began to have thoughts of voluntarily ending his life, which he shared with his wife. In an attempt to reassure him, she told him that she could not live without him and would follow him in his care. By then, both spouses were in their thirties. Jennifer had a promising job, was respected at work, 
had many friends, and was adored by those around her. Benjamin had only a government-appointed disability pension. He socialized only with close relatives and parishioners, as the couple attended church services regularly. He had almost no friends, as people avoided and feared him because of his strange behavior and occasional bouts of aggression. Probably in addition to PTSD and depression, Benjamin was experiencing an impending midlife crisis. It seemed to him that everyone around him was moving forward, striving for something and achieving something, except for himself. Even his wife's care and support began to seem like a mockery to him, and he was tormented by feelings of guilt and shame for his own inferiority. In early December 2012, Jennifer was transferred to night shifts. She now patrolled the streets of Wauwatosa from dusk to dawn, maintaining order. She was very worried about this because her husband would be alone at night, and if he had another nightmare or memory, there would be no one to help him. As their seventh wedding anniversary approached, Jennifer was thinking of taking a vacation, planning a trip to the ocean for a change of scenery and relaxation. On December 17th, she shared these plans with a colleague, but these plans were not destined to come true because a week later there was a terrible tragedy that cut short the life of a young woman, a tragic incident in a quiet town. On the evening of December 23rd, 2012, just before Christmas, Jennifer came in for the night shift. Throughout her shift, she texted her husband constantly, worried about his condition. Toward dawn, the messages from Jennifer stopped although her husband continued to text her, asking if everything was okay. Early in the morning, at 5 o'clock, the dispatcher tried several times to contact Jennifer, but when the patrolman did not respond, he decided to track down the location of the squad car Jennifer was using. The car was found at the city's fire station, located just five minutes from the police department. Patrol officers often stopped by here to grab a bite to eat or write a report at the end of their shift. However, the officer was still unresponsive, which caused serious concern because it had never happened before. Dispatch sent another officer from the station to the fire station, where a horrible discovery awaited him. Jennifer's squad car was parked at the back door of the building, and just a few feet away, right by the exit, Jennifer lay lifeless on the snow-covered pavement in a pool of blood. She had suffered multiple gunshot wounds to the head at close range, and her face was virtually unrecognizable. The officer immediately reported the incident to the station, from where an investigation team was dispatched to the scene, as well as a medical team. Thus, on the night before Christmas, Officer Jennifer Sieben became the first police officer in the history of the quiet town to be fatally wounded in the line of duty. Suspicious Widower Around 6.30 a.m., Benjamin called the police station, inquiring how his wife was doing and why her phone was not answering. He was told that there had been an incident with Jennifer, without giving details, and was asked to come to the station immediately. He arrived less than half an hour later, looking anxious, but strangely, asking no questions. Benjamin didn't try to find out what had happened to his wife, whether she was hurt, or if she was even alive. He answered a few standard questions, telling what had happened the night before and where he had been while his wife was on duty. According to Benjamin, after his wife left, he went to the store briefly and spent the rest of the evening and night at home playing video games and texting Jennifer until she suddenly stopped responding. In the morning, he called the station and was asked to come in. At the time, he could not be charged, only questioned. Standard procedure. However, the police noted fresh abrasions on his hands and dried blood on them. In response, Benjamin said he struggles with post-traumatic stress disorder and that pain often helps him come to his senses. When the former Marine was finally informed that his wife had been fatally wounded, he had a real breakdown. He jumped up, shouting that it couldn't be true, knocked over a table, and began pounding his fists on the wall. It took several strong officers to subdue and calm the distraught widower. Case Investigation At the crime scene, in the freshly fallen snow, there was only one set of footprints leading from the tire tracks to the back door of the fire station and back. This suggested that the perpetrator was alone, and based on the size of the footprints, it was an adult male. Ballistics analysis yielded even more intriguing results. Five bullets were fired at the officer from two different weapons, the first from a 9mm handgun and the second from Jennifer's service weapon, which the perpetrator had taken with him. 
All of the bullets were aimed at the head. Two in the back of the head and three in the face, indicating personal animosity, deep hostility, or a desire for revenge. However, the young woman had no enemies. Everyone who knew her personally loved and respected her, speaking of her only favorably. On the same day, footage from all the street surveillance cameras leading to the fire station was requested. As it turned out, there were virtually no cars on the roads of the small town in the wee hours of the morning. However, around 4 a.m., a black Toyota Prius with tinted windows and black rims pulled up to the fire station. At some point, the car disappeared from camera view, and a short time later, the same car was seen traveling in the opposite direction, heading directly toward Sabin's home. It is noteworthy that Benjamin arrived at the police station that morning in the same car for questioning, which removes all doubt. He was immediately followed, arrested as the prime suspect, and his house was thoroughly searched. The first thing investigators noticed was the holes in the living room wall. The drywall had been punctured, apparently by fists, and bloodstains were visible around the edges. It became clear that this was where Benjamin had gotten the abrasions on his hands, and it had happened no later than the night before. On the refrigerator door were colorful sticky notes that the couple used to leave messages for each other. If Jennifer's notes radiated love and care, her husband's were either dry and one-worded or so insincere that they seemed like quotes from romance novels. A shell casing from a 9mm pistol was discovered in one of the dresser drawers, and the weapon itself was soon found in the bedroom, in the bedside table on the side where her husband slept. The search for Jennifer's stolen service weapon took the police a lot of time and effort, but eventually the gun was found in a ventilation duct under the ceiling. Forensics confirmed that it was indeed the weapon used to shoot Jennifer. Benjamin's Version At first, after his arrest, Benjamin stuck to his original statement, claiming that he had not left the house and denying his involvement in his wife's death, insisting that he loved her and could not have hurt her. However, when he was presented with irrefutable evidence of his guilt, he began to sob and testify. He revealed that he had suffered from various manifestations of post-traumatic stress disorder for years after returning from the war zone. Neither the love and care of his wife nor his church nor experienced doctors could help him. Recently, he had been thinking more and more about voluntarily ending his life, and he shared this thought with his wife. However, she persistently discouraged him, claiming that she could not live without him and would follow him. It is alleged that Ben decided to dispose of his lover out of mercy. He reasoned that they were both religious people, and if Jennifer took her own life, it would be a grave sin leading the soul to eternal damnation. So he decided to spare his beloved from eternal suffering and take all the burden by ending her life and then ending his own. Benjamin knew that his wife, like her co-workers, stopped by the firehouse at the end of her shift to write a report. He watched her for days to make sure, to find out the exact time and place where she parked her car. That fateful evening he arrived on time, about 15 minutes before his wife got out. He waited for her right at the door, acting quickly and decisively, firing two shots to the head with a pistol he had brought from home. Then he claims she turned around, drew her service weapon, which he had taken from her, and fired three more shots to the head. However, it was the expert's opinion that the first two shots to the head were fatal and that she was unable to turn around or reach for the gun. Moreover, the entry wounds indicated that the last three shots were fired into her body while she was lying on the ground. In addition, it was unclear why Ben shot her five times in the head, substantially disfiguring her face, necessitating a closed casket funeral. Trial and Sentencing In the end, Benjamin fully pleaded guilty, but attributed his actions to a severe mental disorder, stating that he was not aware of his actions. As a result, a psychiatric evaluation was ordered, which showed that although the man suffered from severe complex post-traumatic stress disorder, he was fully aware of what he was doing. Moreover, Sabina had planned the crime in advance, subsequently tried to cover his tracks and hide evidence, and continued to send messages to his now-deceased wife's cell phone to avert suspicion. Witnesses, including friends and co-workers of the deceased, testified that the husband was jealous of his wife's career success and often took it out on her. In addition, 
Benjamin was insanely jealous of Jennifer's male co-workers. He believed that his wife could leave him at any time because she is surrounded by young, healthy men who do not have the physical and psychological problems that he had. His jealousy and suspicion, compounded by his anxiety, drove her to despair. Sabina appeared in court in a wheelchair, bound hand and foot because of his constant attempts to harm himself. He fully pleaded guilty, cried, apologized to his mother-in-law, and stated that if he could turn back time, he would never hurt the woman who loved him and whom he loved. In June 2013, Benjamin was found guilty of first-degree premeditated murder despite serious mental health issues. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 35 years. Jennifer's mother stated in court that she forgave her son-in-law and left his fate in the hands of God. The defendant's mother testified that her son returned from military service a completely different person, deeply distressed both physically and mentally, broken and lost. She and her daughter-in-law tried desperately to help him, but the darkness in his soul was overwhelming. In addition, the case of Officer Jennifer Sabin's death subsequently sparked a heated debate over whether her name should be included on a Washington memorial honoring law enforcement officers killed in the line of duty. Initially, the decision was made to exclude her name because of the nature of her death. However, after significant protests and collective petitions from Wisconsin residents, her name was eventually added to the memorial wall. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to the channel and also don't forget to click the bell. There are many shocking stories ahead.